And we don't talk about this terribly much. I guess it's something we're not supposed to be mentioning. But the reality is that according to the latest analysis, in 2005, the top 1% of earners made more money than the bottom 50% of Americans. 1% earned more income than the bottom 50%, which translates into the top 300,000 earners making more money than the bottom 150 million. 300,000 making more money than the bottom 150 million. While the top earning one one hundredth of one percent received an average income increase of 4.4 million in 2005, the bottom 90 percent saw their average income decline by about $172. So what we are looking at is tens of millions of Americans working hard. They're seeing their health care costs go up. They're seeing their housing costs go up. They're seeing education costs go up. They're seeing the price they're paying for a gallon of gas to put into their car to get them to work going up. Home heating oil going up. Basics of life going up. And at the end of the year, they have less money than they did the previous year. But the people on top are making out like bandits. And it is, in fact, many of them are bandits. And it is high time that we began to address the issue of income inequality in this country. Now, I talked a moment about income. That's how much money people make in a year. But the same phenomenon takes place regarding wealth. And the unfair distribution of wealth, which is accumulated income, is even more appalling. Forbes magazine recently found that the wealthiest 400 Americans, 400 people, not a whole lot, were worth, Mr. President, $1.54 trillion in 2006. 400 people, $1.54 trillion. That is up $290 billion from the previous year. In other words, while inflation-adjusted real wages declined for the vast majority of working people in our country, the top 400 wealthiest, wealthiest individuals saw, on average, a $750 million increase per person. Not bad on average, $750 million. Today, disgracefully, and this is an issue I am going to come back to a time and time and time again until this body does something about it. Disgracefully, and despite all the rhetoric we hear around here about family values, the United States has at 18 percent the highest rate of childhood poverty of any major country on earth. 18 percent of our kids are living in poverty. You go to Scandinavia, the numbers are 3, 4 percent, Europe 5, 6 percent, 18 percent. Almost one in five children in this country lives in poverty. Since President Bush has been in since President Bush has been in office, as I mentioned earlier, nearly 5 million Americans have slipped into poverty. We now have 37 million people in this country living in poverty. Almost 9 million have lost their health insurance. 3 million have lost their pensions. People work their entire lives. They expect to have a pension when they retire. And in many cases, corporate America says, oh, by the way, we're changing the rules of the game. Thanks for working for us for 30 years, but you're not getting the pension that you were promised. Mr. President, as 35 million Americans struggled to put food on the table last year, that's called food security. We have 35 million Americans in this country who worry about whether or not they're going to have enough to eat. And that number is going up. Within that reality, we have another reality, and that the wealthiest people in this country are increasingly emulating the robber barons of past decades as they garishly look for ways to spend their fortunes. They have a very difficult time. I mean, if you work hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars, 
What are you going to buy? What do you need? Another pair of shoes? Hard to say. Well, what they're doing is looking into things like yachts that are longer than football fields, all kinds of excesses to show everybody just how wealthy they are. Robert Frank is a reporter for the Wall Street Journal, and he has written a, a recently published book called Richestan. And he writes in his book that households with a net worth of between 100 million and a billion, the very top of the top, spent last year on average $182,000 on watches. On watches. I got a good watch. It's worked well for five years. I think it cost me 30 bucks. But they managed to spend um, they managed to spend $182,000 in one year on watches. That's what they do. And it's very important, Mr. President, that we continue to give these people tax breaks. I mean, I really do think so. I mean, if you could only spend $182,000 on watches, clearly, clearly the president is right, and we need massive tax breaks to help these folks out. But it, it is not just the money they spend on watches. Uh, Mr. Frank, the author of Richest Land, details how during this one-year period, one year, the same economically elite households spent $311,000 on automobiles. Now, how many cars do you buy for $311,000? I don't know. I don't know how many cars people need. $397,000 in one year on jewelry. And obviously, the stress is very great figuring out how you're going to spend that money. So they have to spend, on average, $169,000 on spa services. I mean, you're sitting around. It's, it's a tough thing. What new watch do you buy? What new vehicle do you buy? It's tough, and, and you need spa services. That's where they're spending money. But also, as it happens during that same year, 400,000 qualified young people in this country Mr. President, they couldn't afford to go to college. They didn't have enough money to go to college. Our nation is in desperately needed, desperate need of a well-educated workforce. We all know that a ticket to the middle class in many cases is a college education. So while the richest people in this country are spending $182,000 a year on watches, we have hundreds of thousands of kids who can't go to college. Mr. President, the decline of the middle class combined with the growing income inequality in our nation is a national scandal, and it's something that we must address. And I think it is high time that members of Congress kind of look beyond the wealthy campaign contributors who fund the operations in both the House and the Senate and began to deal with the needs of the middle class and working families. I think we have got to reorder our national priorities. What we have to say to the wealthiest people in this country, President Bush has given you hundreds of billions of dollars in tax breaks, and yet we have children in this country who are hungry. We have millions of children who lack health insurance, and you know what? We are going to rescind the tax breaks that have been given to you so that we can take care of not only our children, but we can take care of those people who are disabled. I don't know, uh, Mr. President, about Colorado, but I can tell you that in Vermont, one of the serious problems that we have is higher and higher property taxes. And one of the reasons that property taxes for education are going up is because the Congress has not kept the promises that it made in terms of funding special education. And special education, as you know, is a very expensive proposition. So local school districts have to come up with the money that the federal government promised but has not committed. So I think we should be adequately funding and actually keeping the promise we made with special education. And we have got to begin to stand up for all Americans and not just for the wealthier. So when my Republican friends talk about tax breaks and tax breaks for the richest people in this country, I say enough is enough. At a time when we have already the most unequal distribution of wealth and income, the very richest who are doing phenomenally well do not need more tax breaks.